as long as you can develop cheaper than an appraisal, there really is no issues because then now we're a teammate of theirs. It leads to more things because they're like, well, if we can keep unlocking equity, we're going to have less equity into these bigger projects that produce cash flow. Everyone's winning. And I think that's really what you have to get to when you're doing any kind of investing. Do you love your job, but want other investment options than your company's 401k and trying to pick stocks? If so, you've come to the right place. In this podcast, you will get actionable information for your passive real estate investment journey. Welcome back to another episode of Work Hard, Invest Harder podcast. Here's your host, Justin Dixon. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Work Hard, Invest Harder podcast. I'm your host. Today, we've got Mark Kuhn on the podcast. Really interesting episode. We kind of start early on in his life when he was working for his dad's construction company before having a little bit of a falling out and going to college and getting fired from a W-2 job right after college. And then kind of found out by accident that he's an entrepreneur and he started his own construction business building and developing luxury storage units. We unpack his journey as an entrepreneur. We unpack his journey kind of going into different parts of real estate, creative financing at the end of the podcast is super interesting. So really interesting episode. We kind of unpack a lot of stuff that I think will be very helpful. So let's get Mark on the pod. All right, Mark, welcome to the podcast. Happy to have you on, man. Hey, thanks. How are you doing, Justin? I'm doing really well. So why don't we jump right in here, maybe give the audience a little bit of an update overview of what you're up to, and then we'll unpack some stuff. Yeah, man. So basically, I'm developing storage units. I'm a real estate developer. So we are building, I'm calling them luxury storage is how I'm terming them. But instead of just all self-storage, 5 by 10s 10 by 10s we're doing larger, deeper storage. So 18 by 30s 18 by 40s 18 by 50s larger size. I'm in the Midwest, so we're heating them and got a couple lights and an outlet and the rent's still all inclusive. It's still served just like a self-storage unit would be. That's what I've been up to as of late, but I'm also a contractor for 13 years and the real estate piece just gives me another vertical being a real estate developer. So that came a little later in life. And yeah, now I'm trying to figure out if I'm going to self-perform manage and manage all these new properties or if I'm going to outsource it. So kind of that right now. So I've got a few things cooking. Yeah, no, it sounds like you've got a lot in the plate. So I guess I always like to learn about people's origin stories and you know how they got exposure to real estate. Because unless you grew up in an entrepreneurial household, it's not as easy to get exposure to real estate investing as it is you know normal stocks and and four hundred one ks and all that fun stuff. So, oh, yeah. how did your journey kind of start in this world? Yeah, man. So my whole journey, like my dad, ever since I was like little, like six years old, it started with him. He owned his own construction business, and so I learned the craft of construction and specifically concrete work. But as I grew up, went to college because, of course, dad told me, he's like, you don't want to be pouring concrete for the rest of your life. You should probably go to college, get an education, and that way you're not stuck here. Well, I went to four years of college, built up some student loans, also developed quite the liver through high college and still 12 credits short of a degree today. So I can't even say that I got it. But I did what dad told me. And I think I followed the herd of what everyone was told to do, right? Like, that's what you do after high school and go to college. But I started butting heads with dad kind of after college. I helped him all the way through high school, all the way through college. And then we butt heads and I went and got a W-2 job. Actually, my last year of college is when I got this. I was actually working full time and just stopped helping dad altogether. So then that was my first summer with like a W-2, like outside of working for my dad and his construction company. And so I actually met my fiance and bought a house and I got all this stuff and then actually got fired from my W-2 job. I kind of found out that I am an entrepreneur and I don't know Mm. that when you find out that, and I wasn't really sure what people said. They would talk to me like, hey, you're kind of an entrepreneur, visionary guy. And I very much, and I didn't know what that was, right? Like no one tells you, hey, you're an entrepreneur. (laughs) Anyway, in my take. So long story short, I decided that, hey, instead of going back into finding another W-2 job, I know construction really well. And I think it can pay our mortgage and I can keep the fiance or not have her leave me. So that's what I did. I just started doing concrete jobs and odd jobs. A fart fan was one of my first jobs that I ever did. And it was just a temporary thing to get me through the summer. Well, lo and behold, you fast forward all the way up to now, I'm still doing construction. So you can kind of see how the story would go. Yeah. So I ended up being a pretty decent contractor. By This was in 2010 when we started. 
Okay, got it. Okay. And kept going all the way up until about 2016, 2017. I actually had a pretty good sized company. I had 10, 12 people already working for me. I thought we were doing probably three ish million revenue, which was pretty good because I pretty much ran everything myself. And that was also the biggest problem I had though. I actually ended up in the hospital with panic attack and I was having night sweats and I think just anxiety was screaming through my body, but everything was going well. Like I was making yeah. revenue. And I was doing well, right? Like in my eyes, I was the perfect American dream of what I thought being successful was. But I just realized at that point when I was in the hospital that this business just running me. I don't have a business here. If I die, my family's got nothing. Yeah. So a lot of realization in that. And then I started getting curious after that time. I was healthy. I left the hospital. But it was a wake-up call and saying that, hey... I need to take care of myself health wise because I was the six coffees and two monsters aren't necessarily healthy for all the construction guys, but that's the life I was living. Yeah, it's a physical job outside and you got to keep the energy high. So it was through monsters. Well, then I realized, hey, I need, you know, I was 26, seven years old. I needed to like actually like start working out and like I physically was fit because I was doing concrete work, but actually very unhealthy, all the habits that I formed. Then I started getting curious on like, hey, well, how do people have businesses they can just like go take vacation on? Like if I went on a vacation, I like pretty much got to stop the show and like when I get back, we'll come. So I just curious about how we run a business and how do the wealthy actually get wealthy? What do they do? And then you end up starting to hear the word real estate quite a bit. So that's my curiosity. I think Grant Cardone started popping up on my phone and like yelling like, you need to invest in what the super wealthy do. And if you're not making money while you're sleeping, you're doing it all wrong. And so then the curious path of that really just drove my attention to real estate. So I started making a pivot. That's a fascinating story. I'm always intrigued. What seemingly started out as a, oh, I started a business and I fell into kind of construction. And then you kind of had this fork in the road, sitting in a hospital bed with anxiety and realizing, hey, my habits are and sending me to an early grave if things continue, right? And so... Um, obviously you had a very traumatic event that caused you to kind of pick your head up and look elsewhere. So before we jump into real estate, and this is a real estate focused podcast, I'm curious the run the business piece, because I think there's a lot of people out there, myself included in this until recently, where you start a business thinking that you're an entrepreneur and maybe you've got yourself as the only employee, or you've got like you, you've got 10, but literally if you stop, the business stops. And if you don't, manage everything, nothing happens, right? So how did you kind of start to implement things into your business to have it run as effectively while you're not managing everything? Yeah. So my dad taught me, you know, it's like you do it yourself because you do it the best. It's just an old mentality that doesn't teach you business necessarily. I learned lots of skills from my dad, of course, but I didn't know how to run people or keep them accountable. And your biggest fear, I think, when you're breaking into that, you're like, hey, I'm going to have to hire somebody. Well, how many people is it going to take to replace you? Is it six? Is it three? Is it two? And it really depends how much you're willing to pay because you're going to lose margin. Like when you make that that flip, you're going to lose margin right now because you're going to have to figure out how to keep them accountable. What is their role? What do you want them to focus on? Is it everything or is it just one thing? You know what I mean? And that was the hardest part because I started not making as much money as I was used to, right? Because I was doing everything. I mean, it just made sense, but I knew that I had to. So I started hiring key people I started paying more money for people, finding people for my weaknesses. I just identified what I was weak at and it was project management. I don't like to sit and do scheduling and do all this tedious work on the computer. I hired that. I was actually better in the field than I was anything. Mm -hmm. And so I knew that. So I just hired the pieces around me. I actually, I brought in my wife at that point. She left her job. So we were really reliant on this business. Yeah, Um, you were all in. Yeah, she did the finances and she is very analytical and very good people. So she could hire, she was our HR. So I just started surrounding myself with these people with my strength was running the field and driving work and started picking up the pieces. And then if you fast forward from like 2017 to 2020, we really dove all into EOS. And so we actually started developing a board and EOS was the only reason that I was able to triple my business from 2020 to 2023 even. You know, I could die today and at least I know that the company will take care of itself. My wife is not running the business. She's not even in the day-to-day business anymore. I spend one to two hours at that construction company today. 
Got it. Well, I want to unpack the EOS piece because I think that's super interesting. And for those of you who don't know, we'll unpack it here in a second. But let's take a quick sponsor break and we will be right back. Whether you're trying to hire a full-time employee or a contractor to fill a gap, Hire Tomorrow can help. Hire Tomorrow is a boutique recruitment firm that has successfully filled sales and marketing, human resources, and technology positions with companies ranging from startups to Fortune 500. If you're struggling to find the right talent, check out HireTomorrow.com or reach out to recruiting at HireTomorrow.com to see how they can help. All right, we are back on the Work Hard, Invest Harder podcast. We've got Mark Kuhn. And so before we kind of took a quick break, we were talking about your construction business and the journey that you took to that and finding people. Before we took a break, we talked a little bit about how you implemented a strategy or a system called EOS to help accelerate the business growth. Quick highlight, what is EOS? Uh, Somebody's listening to this and they're an entrepreneur or they're thinking about starting a business. How can it help to implement this system to, like you said, you tripled your business revenue in three years, right? So quickly, what is EOS and how did you kind of implement that? Yeah, so it's an entrepreneurial operating system and it's anything, it can run a $100,000 a year coffee shop and it can run a billion dollar company. And it's just a platform. It's a unique structure that gives you transparency through the company. So it gives you a lot of communication lines, but you as the owner cannot be responsible for every area of the company. It puts key people in key positions and keeps people accountable and keeps the company growing to a greater vision. So like you're going to create $10 million of revenue. You break it down with the team. You're no longer the only decision maker. And I think once you can get around that, that's when you can really adopt EOS. And the key to it is you're trying to pull yourself as the owner out of the company and trying to actually create a valuable business. And once you create a valuable business, now you have an extra strategy. Even if you don't want to, at least you have one. Right. And you can buy your time back to go create more things. I think that's a great kind of summary because you can unpack that even deeper if we really wanted to. But I think it makes sense because I've read it. I've worked with clients on my recruiting business side that are implementing it. And they are like, hey, I need you to hire me an operator, right? The visionary and the operator, the visionary and the integrator. And so you've got these two kind of key people that you need to hire and entrepreneurs are typically one or the other. And so you've got to kind of find those other pieces to the puzzle. So Let's transition into the real estate stuff that I think I'm super excited to kind of learn about. So when you started kind of getting Grant Cardone yelling at you for social media and everything like that, which he's one of the first people that I started listening to because he was everywhere. When you started to kind of think about, I need to start living and investing like the rich do, right? Because that's how you build generational wealth and everything. Where did you start? I didn't know enough about it. I didn't know why you actually invest in real estate. You know what I mean? You're taught your whole life to save and to put it in a 401k and to work hard. And right. hopefully at one point at 60 or 65, you played your card right, you're going to retire and you're going to be fine. And I grew up very in poverty. So I always wanted a lot out of life and I'm very entrepreneurial. So yep. when Grant Cardone started banging, I don't know, apparently the guy was everywhere in about that timeline, 17, yeah. 18. That's all you heard. I was Grant Cardone. And you know what? He's just exposing what the super wealthy were doing, you know? And he's like, Hey, it's passive income. You start hearing cash flow, And it's like, those are the first times I've ever heard those in my life. And yeah, I'm through college. You know what I mean? I have a business right. management degree. And I was like, I didn't hear those words that often. And so, you know, he's just exposing, he's like, Hey, and I pay zero in taxes and Trump pays zeros in taxes. And all these super wealthy guys don't pay any taxes. It's like, yeah. wait a minute, I paid five, six grand for my W-2 job that I had. It's like, why are we all paying the taxes? So, you know, Grant's just a guy, he's just digging in, right? He's just every little thing he hits at. It hits home with you and you're like, oh, okay. So why would you do real estate? Well, then you figure out, oh, there's these real estate professionals and you know what? They're making millions of dollars in their day-to-day income and then they buy a tower or a apartment building and they wipe out their taxes. It's like, you can do that. You know what I mean? You just don't. Legally, right. It's all legal, right? This is all normal. <laughs> People know about it. And yeah. yeah. And, and what, then, what part yeah. of the real estate space did you jump into? Like once you started, it sounds like you kind of started your journey on the research path, right? You've got to kind of yeah. learn before you jump in. Where did you lean in initially? And did your construction business, were you doing commercial? Were you doing residential on that side? Yeah, really good point. At 2017, 2018, we actually flipped completely to commercial at okay. this point. Because we realized that the construction company was starting to be a tool 
for a future development company, which could produce the real estate and I could hold it on the backside, creating yep. Mac capital, where I actually syndicate and bring investors into those projects with us. So I was able to create these verticals, having the investment, the construction and the development all together and realize that, yeah, this can be possible. And this is a long term game, right? Like I could buy and had great investors. It would not only benefit my companies, but create a nicely vertically stacked company that I wanted. The construction is where we were the strongest, but we stemmed off of that. So that's really what the vision was. But then, yeah, I started building these townhomes. I just started, uh, which isn't commercial necessarily, but it just grew from there. We did like a 52 unit townhome complex. We actually kept 22 units and did that as our first real estate. And so then now, hey, let's go do storage or let's do apartments. I have about 150 units of apartments myself and then a few storage portfolios. So you built this vertically integrated company, so to speak, where you were syndicating the development, right? So you're like, hey, we're going to build this 52 unit townhome community. So you would bring in, you would buy the land, spec it out and all that fun stuff, bringing in investors to help with the initial funds. And then you're like, oh, by the way, we're going to use my construction company, who hopefully will give you a little bit of a better price than what you would get on the open market. But you are going to make money on kind of the both sides of it, right? You're going to do the development, and then you're going to do the construction. And then ultimately, you're going to hold it and all that fun stuff. So that's yep. super interesting. Did any of your investors, were did they see you having the construction side of it as a potential conflict of interest or as an added benefit? As long as you can develop cheaper than an appraisal, there really is no issues, right? Because now we're a teammate of theirs. Now we're a weapon for them. And yeah. so they're like, well, can you do this other pro-? You know, it, it leads to more things because they're like, well, if we can keep unlocking equity, we're going to have less equity into these bigger projects that produce cash flow. And right. so everyone's winning. And I think that's really what you have to get to when you're doing any kind of investing. Everyone's got to win, right? At the yeah. end of the day, the guys with capital, they have to win too. Yeah, yeah, they need so, to be the win the most because they're the ones that are going to be knocking down your door if things aren't going to play. <laughs> yep. And there's plenty of experiences, but when you can negotiate everything to a win-win, then you really yeah. can build a lethal team. So that's really how it started. Talk about that first deal. So talk about, obviously, you did the research. You were like, okay, I think this could be a vertically integrated business. You started Mac Capital. So what was the first deal that you did and how did it go? Yeah. So we actually, these so a group of investors, I'm in North Dakota. They yep. came to North Dakota and were doing a development. We were building it for them, actually. And this was right after the oil boom. So right around 20, yeah, or well after the oil boom, but they bought it after the oil boom. And then they just wanted out, right? Like yeah. I think Vegas started clipping pretty hard in that timeline. And they're just like, we need out of North Dakota. So I ended up buying it from them. They just took a loss on it and they're like, we're out. So that kind of gave me the insight of like, oh, now I can build out these units. So we were actually building them just to sell them because it's it. nothing different than a build to rent model, you know, right. today. But we actually kept 22 of the townhomes in there and just grouped them together because it was just ones that we rented instead of sold them. Cause we had like, you could sell them, you can lease to own them, or you could just rent them. And some we had lease to owns that fell through and some rents. But they were all full and they're all affordable housing. And we got them all cheaper than we were they're appraising for. So then yeah. we ended up just creating a portfolio for investors and let them in it. So I could back some equity out really is how right, right. we ended up doing it. And you also had people in the unit. So you had a proof of concept. So you're like, here's the actual model that's already running. I just yeah. need to put money into it so I can pull some money out of it. Correct. And you're just going to be buying into a cash flowing property. Yeah. And that's how a lot of times, like in the development world, you always need the proven concept, like you say. And so it works a lot of time where I'll just go get all front the debt and equity up front, get the development going. And then basically towards the end of stabilization, we'll back out some funds so then we can have some capital to go do another one. And it really takes the risk off for the investors and we can continue to keep rolling instead of like, stop. Oh, we can't raise enough money for this deal. Then the deal doesn't go right. So yeah. we're to a point now where we can do that. But at the beginning, yeah, you got to. Yeah, you got to promise a vision, right? And so with the development world, I'm more on the syndication side for multifamily. Okay. So you buy something that already exists that has current revenues and you can map out kind of what you project the revenues to be. And that's obviously where you make your margin. But for development, you're really in this kind of like, hey, here's this raw piece of land that we think we can build these really attractive units, whether they're storage or townhome or apartments. And we think the building, once it's done, will be worth X. So you have to promise 
higher returns to those initial investors, right? Because they're not going to get any cash flow for the first handful of years, depending on how big the scope of the project. But to your point, what you're doing is saying, we're going to build it to a point, start filling it up with tenants, and then you're proving the model, right? You're saying, okay, we thought we projected 1200 bucks for rent. We're actually getting 13, right? And yep. so our pro forma should be better. And so you're de-risking it for an investor. And you know that's a great story or opportunity to get into. I would imagine your investors are probably happy to kind of get into that stage, even though the returns may be different than if they were in the front end of the development. Yeah, absolutely right. A lot of people like syndicators that are just buying multifamily, buying and flipping deals, if they just can't find deals or the deals are unreasonable or they just don't cash flow, it's like, I'm just in the other lane where I'm doing more development. And I obviously have the vertical, I can do that. And I know if it pencils or not, and I'm willing to take on the front load, the risk. It seems like the investors like that model a little better. Of course, they're not fronting anything then. But of course, we ask them, you know, within our portal, it's like, if they want to get into the deal earlier, then first come, first serve. Because usually by the time it's filled up, and especially if you're over rents, it fills up fat, you know, it's gone. That's just the way it is. And people like new assets. There was something with new, right? And value add oh. deals, you're constantly remodeling because something going on. Well, you constantly, even though you do a full due diligence, right? You look at every unit, you look at every AC unit, et cetera. There always is something that happens, especially if you buy something that was built in the seventies, right? That's, you know, oh, yeah. old. so you're never going to be not doing some type of maintenance on that yeah. property. So theoretically, when you build something brand new or you buy new construction, your operating expenses when it comes to repairs and maintenance is lower because you don't have as much repair because you theoretically are building it to spec and it's new and all that fun stuff. So what are you doing in the storage space? Obviously, we started the conversation with you kind of building out this luxury storage units like you mentioned. So I'm kind of curious why luxury and where are you doing it? Like, How are you finding places to build storage? Yeah. So in the storage game, it's no different than self storage. You want to be visible. But for our model, like again, we're heated or cooled, depending upon your market. I know you're in Austin, we're in North Dakota. So yeah. different climates. So we're heated up here right now. We're proving our model through the Midwest, but you just got to think about housing, like even expensive housing, like it's getting tighter. HOAs are getting more strict, right? Like you can't even park in your driveways in some of these areas. And things are just getting smaller, right? You're getting less land for more money, basically, at right. the end of the day. Afford it. All this housing is just getting more dense. Multifamily is great for that, but these townhome communities are very tight and nowhere to park anything. So um, basically, we're planting these by those areas if they don't have them themselves and, you know, the heated storage. So we could fill these units and small contract. It's half the money of like, say a contractor shop. If a contractor shop was 2000 a month, we'd be half the money at a thousand. And of course you're not getting, you know, every amenity, but you're getting heat, air conditioning, lights, and outlet. And so you have everything you need. We started building them as our like RV, like and campers and boats. And we thought like, that's going to be the thing. And it's like, I think there's one RV or camper in our, any of our facilities. So it's like, it's not even that it's just strictly people that don't have space. And whether it's bad times or good times, we're going into restrictive territory now and they're still filling up. So it's like they just downsize from their bigger area. I don't really know. Yeah, I, I feel like the storage is fairly recession proof because I don't know the stats, but I feel like during COVID storage did better than any other commercial real estate asset class or something like that. The benefit is you don't have um, to deal with eviction notices and laws and things. It's like, what, 30 to 60 days if you don't pay your rent. It's I'm on to the next one. I'm locking it up An and option. I'm selling your yeah. stuff, right? So yeah. that's a, a very attractive thing. And I've actually started to look into storage myself because of that simple fact. There are certain states and certain municipalities that it's very difficult to evict people, even if they haven't paid rent for months and months and months. Um, so that's a very attractive piece to the the storage. And how big are these? You mentioned the unit sizes. I'm curious about how many units you're typically putting into these developments. Yeah. So obviously with our model, you can't vertically build these, right? So it doesn't work really good in like a primer. Like it would have to be an outside tertiary market. That's right, so you buy a, a, a suburb of some sort. Of land, right? Yeah. 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 You're going to need four acres probably for a site like this. Three to six, we'll call it, is what we look for. And, you know, you're going to get a site efficiency of 40%, which just means how much building can land on the land itself. And if you can get north of that, then you're doing really good in our model. So it yeah. just doesn't work. It's not like one of those three-story self-storage facilities on the corner where you can pull in. But 
we do our occupancy stays pretty high compared to those because like as you go on up the floors they get less occupancy but in our models just bigger right like we're doing 30 foot by 18 foot wide bays and these things are 16 foot tall so they can put anything that goes down the highway you can get it through a 14 foot a 12 by 14 foot door i thought you would have more rv camper storage that's a big thing around austin is you drive down you see storage units and then you see the big bays in the back and you've got campers and RV vans and things like that in there. So also yeah. that's like a booming thing right now with digital nomadism and, you know, people living off oh, the grid and all that stuff. So yeah, storage, it's automation. That's playing another factor that how it beats up multifamily. I mean, storage was the best thing through the 08 recession as well. I and mean, yeah. very few facilities ever went into foreclosure and it actually surprisingly did very well. And I just think the automation that they're going to like everything's Bluetooth on your phone, how to get into your unit. If you don't pay your bill, you get locked out. You can control your rent. You know, these REITs, it's so funny how they do these self-storage facilities. Like they'll open a new facility and it would be like opening up a new apartment and say the market rents 1200 bucks. Well, they open it up at 300 bucks a month rent, you know? So they drop it to like a quarter and fill up the occupancy, right? Fill up the occupancy because storage is very sticky when people move all their stuff in there. And then all of a sudden they quadruple the rent right overnight, but they might lose 20, 30% and they're fine with it. Right. But they're netting out in a positive because if you cut it by, yeah. So talk about that because, you know, obviously when you rent an apartment, you're typically signing a year lease. Right. And so you're locked in at your lease rent for a year. How does it work in storage? I haven't rented a storage unit probably in over a decade. So I can't remember how it all works, but how are the terms? Are they similar or the raising the rents is more automated, I guess? Yeah. So, I mean, that's the glory of self-storage is that you can turn the dial at any moment, right? Like if we need to dial up rents a hundred bucks and our occupancy is way too high next month, you got software that'll tell you, Hey, you could probably turn up the rents and it dictates the rents around it through other self-storage facilities. So usually if you're going to move out of your storage unit, you rent it the first November and you want to keep it, you'd have to put in, usually it's 60 days. They'll make you give them. So you're going to be in there two, three months regardless. Yeah. Summer month, you know, day to day. But I mean, in most cases, there'll be a move out period. So storage is sticky though. When people get their stuff in there, they don't, necessarily pull it out. And that's these big REITs, they know the game. So that's what everyone's doing. Now, all these new facilities coming online, they're like dropping the market rents, the street rents way down there. And then they fill right up and then they jack all the rents back up and then they end up stabilizing. And when you underwrite these deals, how do you think about occupancy? Like obviously when we think about multifamily, you want to be in the mid nineties because that means that you're charging enough rent, but not too much where you're still able to fill it. Like, is it similar occupancy rates that you're targeting when you do your underwriting? You know what? It depends who you talk to, but 85%, usually mid 80s. If your building is over 85, I would say there's more units that are going to come online at some point. And yeah, units do stay at 90 plus percent, especially lately. But usually at the mid 80s, you're sitting really well. And that's what I usually underwrite to 85 is that key number. And then is it typically similar to a multifamily value add where you're holding it for five years or because you're developing it, are you flipping it faster? Usually if you develop a multifamily, you're flipping out of it at some point as you're stabilizing it because you got to pull out a lot of equity and pay your investors. But what's your typical hold period if you're an investor getting into these deals with you? You know what? For most of my deals, it's I try to hold on to them for 10 years. I'm not looking to exit them. Really what model I'm going after is we're just trying to get up to about 40, 50 of these sites because the multiple gets so much better at the REIT level or, you know, and then exit a big portfolio to them. Yeah, correct. Yeah. It gets more worth them. So we're just trying to build a brand through a management company and build enough sites where you can get their attention. No different than what Grant Cardone's doing, right? People would love to buy his portfolio. You mentioned in the beginning, before we kind of jumped into a lot of stuff here, you kind of were thinking about self-managing or hiring a management company or building a management company. Like, What's your decision criteria to do one of those options? And also maybe before that, when I think about multifamily, I think about 100 units means I can have on-site staff, right? So somebody's going to be there 24-7 in a leasing office. Somebody's going to be there 24-7, well, not 24-7, but on-site five, six days a week for repairs and maintenance. You obviously don't have people on site at these locations 24 or 7 or 5 days a week, right? Like, what is the management piece that is needed for storage? Yeah, usually you will have one manager per four or five locations. So even if it's a 400 unit site or something like saying a self storage facility, 
One manager in a territorial area should be able to manage those as the asset manager and then have maybe a site pay one of the tenants, you know, no different than you would have someone at the building be a building maintenance, something incentivize that for a tenant. So that typically outruns because everything's getting so automated in storage. Like you see even these little like storage facilities were always built with like the 20 by 20 like hut where like you go into the and there's no one in there anymore. There's no one even on site because you can literally automate everything online. They can rent online. They can call online. They can chat online. They can log in in the matter of minutes with their phone, with the Noki system from Janus. It's the automation that's killing it for storage and beating multifamily. You know what I mean? It just, it gets a little easier for the managing because in your second part of your question, I was a little gun shy to do my own management because we managed our facilities here in North Dakota and we just didn't have enough units and had a lot of turnover with property managers. And it was just difficult to keep the staff that I needed to. And so basically did it for a year and a half, failed, just consuming too much of my time. It's like, I'm better off developing and talking with yeah. investors and doing the priorities, right? So we just ended up nixing it and went with a bigger management company, basically, that could handle it. does a couple thousand units. Yeah. But really, that's what it takes as a property manager to make it and have the proper staff and actually make a revenue at property management, in my opinion. So I just didn't have enough. It's one of those things, it's the same thing. If in multifamily, it's 100 units is kind of the sweet spot to afford on site payroll, whereas storage, it may be four or 500 units, right? So mm-hmm. that could be four 100 sites or a couple of bigger ones. So but that's interesting because, you know, I would think that the management would be super low from a day to day perspective because, I mean, you're obviously responsible for the building, the units, but there's nothing in it other than their stuff, right? Yep. So you're not worrying about toilets and water and all that stuff. As long as you're paying the electric bill and you go out there and I'm assuming you have to plow because you're in North Dakota for snow and all that fun stuff. But, yeah, you know what that uh, is. That's good. That's right. I grew up in Pennsylvania, so I grew up in the Northeast. Oh, okay. I okay. I know a little bit about snow and, <laughs> yeah, good, and all that fun stuff. I moved down here to get away from that stuff, although it followed me. <laughs> um, but no, I think it's interesting because I hadn't thought about kind of what is required from a property manager other than dealing with tenants, but all that stuff is systematized now by apps. And so I guess, you know, as you think about kind of we're recording this in mid-October 2023, what's the rest of 23 look like? And then what's your kind of plan for 24? And obviously, we're still in this high interest rate environment. Are we in a recession? Are we not? You know, are we going to go in a recession? Are we not? Who knows? Depends on who you ask, I guess. What's your kind of crystal ball outlook? What do you try to drive towards? I think interest rates are here for a while. I don't see them dipping real fast. I think through 24, we're going to see seven to 8% rates. I don't mind this being here. This is like mini recession that we're in because there's 10,000 baby boomers trying to retire every day. And whether I pick up their assets or maybe a business if I want to, you know what? I'm not scared to do that. And I think this is a great time to do that because there's motivation out there for them to retire. And there's guys like you and I looking to acquire assets, hopefully in 10 years, that will be super. So I think that rates are going to be here for longer. I think no, the market data just came out that the retail sales came out strong again today. You can see that the economy is still resilient in where it's at. So that means inflation is still probably pretty hot, hotter yeah. than they're saying. So that's my crystal ball is what I would tell you. I would say sometime in end of 24, end of 25, maybe they'll talk about rates being down to, well, who knows, a little bit lower. We'll just yeah. see. Anyone was sitting at the assets, you just got to run everything as an eight, run everything as it is. And if you can yeah. get the deal to pencil, then do the deal. But it's only going to get better in two years for you. I'm a big believer that if you can make something pencil in this market and it's cash flowing, which is not easy with no. interest rate this pace, in theory... In two years, three years, interest rates will be no higher, which typically when you underwrite multifamily, I don't know how you do it in in storage, but you typically will assume when you refinance, if you're doing variable rate debt or bridge loans, you're assuming that your interest rate will be higher when you refinance. But theoretically, in a few years, your interest rate could be the same. So your underwriting is great, or it could be a little bit lower, which you would never underwrite anyway. So I think if you can make it work now, it could be a really, really good deal, regardless of what kind of asset class you're in, as long as you yep. are conservative. And you know that's the most overused word in syndication world is, is all my underwriting is conservative. I've yet to hear a syndicator say that their underwriting is aggressive. Well, aggressive on equity. Be a more aggressive, need more equity in the deals, right? Yeah. Like to make them work. And cash flow is pretty much gone. Like cash flow and appreciation, you can't even count them. It's like you need the guys with 
big businesses that need tax benefits. Like at yes. the end of the day, when you invest in real estate, I invest for the keeping more money in my pocket. Yeah, I keep a lot more money in my pocket. And that's one of the reasons that I went into real estate to begin with. And I think as I'm 35 now, but I consider myself slightly young still. So I compounding interest is going to work its magic over the next 20 years where yeah. if I can keep a lot more money in my pocket, I'll be a lot happier. So I think once you add the math of how much tax you'll save in real estate, it makes a lot of sense to invest there. And yeah. the appreciation cash flow will be bonuses. Yeah. And I think one thing you mentioned earlier is interesting and something that I've started to talk to a couple of my buddies about is around the baby boomers retiring. And a lot of them have businesses and they're not the sexy businesses. They're not a SaaS software company. They're a yeah. handyman shop. They're an HVAC thing. And they just don't want to go through another recession. They want to stop climbing on ladders and all that fun stuff. So mm -hmm. I've already talked to a few people that are doing this. They're already kind of scooping up a few different businesses in the same genre and building more of a package deal and rolling them up. So I'm keeping my eyes peeled for situations like that. And I think, you know, in self storage, there's still a lot of mom and pops out there that are just holding these things that they built or bought 30 years ago. And it's just cash flowing and that's their retirement. Eventually they're going to want to just get rid of it and stop having to deal with anything. So yeah, I think there's going to be a ton of opportunity over the next handful of years from a business purchasing perspective for sure. So What's the project you're working on now? You said you've got a project right now that you're working on? Yeah, we're doing a luxury storage facility. Fargo, North Dakota is the one that we're doing now. And yeah, we're just turning dirt, pouring concrete right now. So hopefully have that open by February, March area, start lease up. So um, what's the turnaround time from raw piece of land to opening typically? Usually it takes us about six months. We try to tighten it up. It just depends how many build. Now we're finally getting calls from subcontractors looking for work. So we know things are turning a little bit. Because usually it. it's always us trying to, you know, beg them to get anything done or get a quote even. So yeah. And then usually lease up. Hopefully it doesn't take six months. It just depends on the timing for us up in the Midwest. Yeah. We can go into like fall like it is now. It's a great lease up time because it's getting cold, right? We're on climate controlled storage. But I wanted to get back. What am I doing in 23 and 24? I think that a lot of entry level real estate investors are like, I'm still getting like, I'll buy a sixplex and I'll buy a threeplex and I'll do an 18plex. But I'm buying from baby boomers that are motivated and I'm creatively getting this done. I'm not always using seven or eight percent debt, right? Like I'm just creatively like the Cody Sanchez model of boring. Like that's all I buy is boring assets like class B, C multifamily and storage. So I'm yeah. doing really boring things. All I'm doing is getting creative on the back end and how to finance them. And I think if you can get more creative with your thoughts and you know what, at the end of the day, that baby boomer is going to want price, but yeah, they may be willing to give up some terms to get it. And they're going to have to because it's otherwise it doesn't make any sense for you to do it. So yeah. it's not like we're always using 8% debt and underwriting to that because everyone, we would lowball everyone out there and we would just get laughed upon as real estate guys. It's like, yeah. oh, I'll get the deal done and you know I will. And it's like, I need you to sell or carry and it's probably going to be principal only. Like you ain't going to get any interest on that. And so I put out a lot of content about that and creatively getting deals done because that's the only way it's happening right now. Yeah. Everything is going to have to be creative. So you're doing more like seller financing, right? So explain that. Like, how does that work? How do you talk to a seller that maybe they don't have to sell, but they want to, or maybe they have to? Like, what's the pitch? Yeah, they call you. And I use my social media to look for deals. And they'll be like, usually I'll connect with people's dads. And they'll be like, yeah, you know, I'm, we're looking to sell. We're just looking to get out. Things are getting a little tougher around. And hey, we're willing to sell them for the tax assessment. Oh, okay, perfect. And then I'll underwrite it. And I'll be like, okay, well, maybe it was worth, let's just get a small threeplex or something like 370 is that we'll let it go for that. We'll let it go for the taxes. Oh, it's like, okay, well, I'll underwrite it. It's worth 270 underwriting it, you know, to make it actually pencil. And then once they yeah. get whack in the face, you know, it's like, all right, come to reality, realize I got to underwrite to 8% debt. So I get them yeah. built into that model. And then I just say, well, you know, we're willing to come up, but I need to get terms favorable so I can pay you more. And I usually use the bank as leverage saying, I got to make this make sense and make the DSCR. Right ratios and different things. That's usually how the baby boomer will talk on the small end. Um, on the larger end, the, most of the guys already know it's coming. Like, hey, we need 3 million for this and we're willing to sell or carry a half a million. And so like they want a little cash down. It's just usually the negotiation of interest rates. Like they think they'll get 10% on their money. And it's like, bro, I can't go get debt at 8% and pay you 10%. This ain't making any sense. I said, yeah. You do the math. You know it doesn't work. So I bring them into the underwriting with me. Like I yeah. use full transparency. I'm like, 
for me to take on this risk, this is what I'm going to need. And sometimes baby boomers, they just don't get it. Like they're just stubborn at their price and they'll hold it forever and they'll die with it. You know, it's their loss, really. I mean, I was trying to just get them retired, but you just got to know when to hit the board button and realize you don't got to get married to every deal. Just keep putting offers. There's offers on the MLS that make sense. It's just yeah. get creative. It's going to take some work. It's going to take a difficult conversation or two. And at this point in my life, I enjoy it. <laughs> and this is how I was when I started my journey. I was too emotional about everything, right? You fall in love with the deal. You're like, oh, this deal would be great to get if we could get it. So let's try to sharpen your pencil, so to speak. And at the end of the day, you just have the numbers don't lie. So, you know, yes, they're Excel spreadsheets and you can manipulate every deal to look great. But at the end of the day, you know that it's not going to work out. So you got to be realistic, trust the numbers. If it works, go at it hard. If it doesn't, move on. There's another one, right? So this is super interesting. I want to kind of transition to the final three questions here. So I could have, we could dive into a lot of different things even more. So <laughs> and maybe we'll have you have back and we'll talk about buying businesses and all that stuff. So the first question is, what's one piece of advice that got you started or helped you along your real estate investing journey? Oh, you know, I think the curiosity is one word that helped me a lot. And as soon as I was in that hospital and I got curious about, hey, what is the wealthy doing? How do people have businesses that operate without them? I got curious about self-education and mentors and a lot of that. And so curiosity really stemmed, like really put me on an escalation curve on the upward trajectory. Yeah, no, I mean, it makes sense. There's a lot of times where you start to research stuff and you're like, wait, this sounds interesting. Let me keep going. So yeah, no, I like it. All right. What is your favorite business or real estate book that you're into right now? Oh, you know what? I at my businesses and I have lots of employees. So I've been actually like diving deep on all the John Maxwell books. And so he's Brandon Dawson. If you know him, he's part of actually Grant Cardone. He runs like the Cardone Ventures. Guy's a business guru. And so I think it's called like nine figure companies or something that he just wrote a book, Brandon Dawson. He said he used a lot of John Maxwell leadership. And that's kind of what stemmed the curiosity of that. And it's been good, really good points. John's older, but has really good points and has helped me as a leader. The business principles are transferable regardless of when some of these books were written, which is, you know, super fascinating. So yeah. No, yeah. I'll have to check out the nine figures companies. Book nine figure mindset. That's what it was. Mindset. Okay. Yeah. It's a great book. I haven't seen that one, but cool. All right. Final question. If you hit your financial freedom number, meaning you could live an amazing life just off of the passive income from your investments, what would you do? I thought about this a lot. And I think it just depends where you're at in life. But if I dreamt myself of 50 years old, 60 years old with kids growing up, I'm just a golfer. I'm pretty simple. And I love doing business deals. I think as you're a real estate, like you're a syndicator, I do real estate investments. I just like the enjoyment of doing a deal and everyone having a win-win I think that'll always motivate me till the day I die, unfortunately. Yeah. And I just plan on working, but I also enjoy golfing quite a bit with my son, who's only three now, but I'm taking him. Hopefully he's going to the PGA one day and I can go and watch him. But so there you go. You can, <laughs> you can him hard. and you can be his caddy and get started early, man. That's the name of the game. Just keep, keep a plastic set of golf clubs in his hand and let him, uh, <laughs> let him hack it. Very cool. Well, Mark, really appreciate the time. If people want to reach out, learn more about what you're doing, if they're, or maybe they're in North Dakota and want to come hang out, what's a good way to connect with you? Yeah. So I'm super active on LinkedIn. I put out a lot of content there on creative finance, real estate deals, helping out beginners, whatever, and just deals that I'm doing. I'm just tracking my journey. I live, and then I go one step deeper. If you go in to my LinkedIn and then subscribe to my email kind of called and follow the herd. I literally yeah. will deep dive like real estate transactions I've done, podcasts I listen to, just all the different media that I'll just deliver content that literally how I'm doing this myself. Because people are like curious, like, how did yeah. you do the last deal? How did you do? Why did you do luxury storage? Why did you fail at, you know, property management? Like, and I'll just dive deep, like into what challenges I've had to hopefully help others in the future. Yeah. Avoid the potholes that you fell into and yeah. and, and all that stuff. No, I, I, yeah. I like it. So... Yeah. Awesome. Well, hey, man, I appreciate the time. Really awesome to meet yeah. you and learn about your story. And yeah, it was great to have you on. Yeah, man, I appreciate you having me on. Thanks, Justin. I hope you got value out of this episode of the Work Hard, Invest Harder podcast. Your one-stop shop for education on how you can continue to work hard in your career and have different options to invest even harder. If you took anything away from this episode, please like and comment. I read every comment as it helps me serve you better. Make sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell. That way you won't miss out on more valuable content. 
If you're watching this video, it means that you want to grow your passive real estate portfolio. The easiest way to do that is to join our investor club by heading to greatventurecapital.com slash invest. The link is in the show notes. See you on the next episode.